Hi everyone and welcome to the 14th Field Notes live event. My name is Sarah Russell and I'm a soil scientist in Gilmer, Texas and the Field Notes regional representative for the South Central region. Um, <clears throat> and as that regional representative, I serve on the Field Notes Review Committee. The Review Committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. We've selected two really great, exciting topics for today, and we encourage everyone to ask questions anytime using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should be open by default. However, if for some reason your QA panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon that's located at the right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on the live caption button that's located on the lower right hand corner. Today's session is being recorded and recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Field Notes channel and the National Soil Survey Center's YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it and I hope that you enjoy today's session. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave Hoover to tell you a little more about today's webinar. Dave. Thank you, Sarah. And good morning, folks. Or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Uh, I wanted to give a few uh, remarks on the what we've been able to accomplish over the last 14 webinar sessions. So uh, as Sarah mentioned, this is number 14 here. Including the ones today, we will have made 32 presentations to the country. On this slide, I've shown on the left side the uh, the topic areas, which are mostly correct. I had to generalize a couple of them. Uh, and on the right side, I've included a map of the US as to where those talks have uh, originated from. So what I'd like everybody to do that's on this, this call is take a look at the topics that we have. If you have a area that you don't see represented here, but you think is of interest or should be of interest to our uh, group, please reach out to your regional representatives and schedule a talk on a topic. Doesn't mean that these topics can't be talked about again. You see there are some on there that we've only had one presentation on, so we can certainly go into a little bit more depth with other presentations. Also looking at the map, take a look and if you see parts of the country that you think, huh, why don't we have anything from that state? That's my state. And you want to have uh, it represented. Think about something that's interesting out there. It doesn't have to be one of these topics. It could be on something else. It could be on uh, a really cool road cut that you saw and here's some pictures of it and uh, here are the uh, six different soil orders we found in one road cut. On this map, there are some, uh, it doesn't show that in some places we've had multiple presentations from one office, such as today we're having something out of Sonora and we've had, uh, I think this is our second presentation out of Sonora and we've had about five presentations out of the Price uh, Utah office. But that doesn't mean that we can't continue to do that uh, kind of catches on in an office that we see one person speak on something and we go well i could do that too and you feel moved to do another uh, presentation from that office so this will be available on our, our website if you want to go back and you want to take a look at this uh, list of what has been presented and hopefully that will spur you on to uh, come up with uh, another idea for a presentation of your own and with that little solicitation for presentations, I'll move on to today's agenda. As Sarah mentioned, we have a couple of good presentations today. And starting off will be Julie Baker from the Sonora, California area. And she will be speaking on soil survey of Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Julie, I turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, hopefully, I should be sharing. 
Okay, so um, my name is Julie Baker. I'm in the Sonora Soil Survey Office. Julie, if and... you would please put it in, in presentation mode. Oh, there you go. Great. Oh, okay. I guess there's a little delay. Um, you can't hear me? You're good. Okay, so I... Um, I was going to talk today about the soil survey of Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. This was an initial soil survey that was published last year to Web Soil Survey. Um, our office had been had started working on it in 2012, and I got here in 2014, so it was quite a long project. Um, I put Kathy Scott's name on here. Um, she was the project leader, and. Um, we had a lot of help from various guest diggers, both from uh, our office in Sonora and from various other offices, but the two of us were basically the um, full-time staff on the project and did all of the database and, and geospatial work. So this cover picture is a typical view in the park. Um, this is looking the view from Charlotte Dome, a nice U-shaped glacial valley. Um, so I thought I would use this opportunity to tell you a little bit mostly about the experience of working in a national park rather than um, a lot about the soils and information that you might find on Web Soil Survey. Um, if you're curious, you can look that up, but um, I'll give you a little background about the park and then it'll be more about the experience working there and then a little soil tour at the end. So just to give you a, an idea of where the parks are, here is the Sonora office in the middle of California. This orange band is MLRA 18, the Sierra Nevada foothills. The green band is the Sierra Nevada mountains, both of which our office is responsible for. And then here is Sequoia and Kings Canyon. There's just a tiny little portion in the foothills and then the rest in the mountains. This map shows you the all the different LRUs in the park. It spans quite a range from the foothills through lower montane in the orange, up mid montane in the red, um, upper montane in the green, subalpine in the blue, and then alpine in the teal. For those of you who aren't familiar with California, um, just a brief description of some of those. Um, this is the thermic zone, uh, mostly dominated by grasslands and blue oak savanna in the foothills. Moving up, uh, you go into the lower montane, um, mostly dominated by manzanita and live oaks, seen on, in the background here. Um, as you move up into the mid montane, this is the uh, nice timber air zone um, where you find the giant sequoias and um, lots of big trees in the forest. Uh, it's approximately where the snow line is, so it's like a good balance of precipitation, um, high precipitation, but high, high enough temperatures for lots of growth. Up again to the upper montane, um, you start to get more rock outcrop, but there's still quite a bit of forest. Um, here, there's some lodgepole, uh, Sierra juniper, and Jeffrey pine. Um, the upper montane has usually been extensively glaciated, and a lot of areas have been scoured. Uh, moving up again to the subalpine. Uh, this is a, it's probably um, for backpackers and outdoor enthusiasts, one of the, the nicest zones in the park. You get great views, um, not too many trees in your way. This is where most of the really nice meadows and lakes and the cirques are. And then at the highest elevations in the park and the alpine zone, it's mostly above the tree line, or you might have small areas of Krumholtz, uh, white bark pine usually where it's very low growing um, stunted trees. So one of the issues that we had um, trying to set up our mapping was that all these LRUs that I just went over don't 
match exactly with um, soil temperature regimes. So one of the first things we did was to try and model temperature, uh, soil temperature in the park by using some continuous data from several weather stations we'd set up and then also using point data from um, our individual pit descriptions to um, get a model based on the day of the year um, by correlating those individual pit temperatures to the continuous data. And this is what we came up with. Um, also to orient you, um, this orange line is the John Muir Trail. And here's Mount Whitney on the crest of the Sierras. Um, the giant forest grove and Grant Grove are where um, lots of visitors go and see the giant sequoias. Uh, Mineral King, which I'll mention later, is here in the southern portion of the park. And then some common or popular backpacking destinations are the Ray Lakes area and Evolution Valley up here. So the park span a huge range in elevation um, for 40 meters down at headquarters to um, over 14,000 feet or 4,400 meters at Mount Whitney. The temperature goes from thermic to cryic. Um, precipitation spans quite a range, but it's all uh, xeric except for riparian um, and aquatic areas. And then the geology is mostly granitic uh, with some metasedimentary rocks. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, this is the metasedimentary rocks. And luckily, when you work in a um, national park and uh, there's not too many trees in your way, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between the geologies. So that, that was nice. Um, a little bit about the people. Um, as I mentioned, we had quite a, a crew of um, help doing field work. Um, a few people that I'll point out for people around the country. This is me. Um, this is Kathy Scott, the project leader. Um, Keith Ham was the park archaeologist who accompanied us on quite a few of the trips. And Dave Evans was an ecological site specialist from the Sonora office that did a lot of the ecological site work. Um, yeah, the people had a good time. Um, out in the field mostly. Right. So a little bit about the logistics of getting around in a place like this. We were lucky to have mule support from the parks and the mules were amazing. They could go crazy places as you could see and carry all of our soil gear and personal gear and we could bring things like fresh fruit and um, supplies that you know normal backpackers wouldn't get and then they could carry all our soil samples home. Uh, just a close-up of the park mules. Um, there, This wasn't without mishaps though. We had things like bent augers um, when the mules would run into trees or freak out or you know ripped um, gear but it was very nice having the park support. Mostly the people had to walk around though. Um, this was on a trip where we actually did a couple days where the mules couldn't go in Ionian Basin and we had to backpack, um, but it was uh, amazing. And we did a lot of sampling in the park and we set up approximately 80 new soil series. Um, this is Chris Sevastio. This is Chris in the hole here. He was the first project leader before Kathy took over and Jennifer Wood, our soil data quality specialist. Um, we sampled in a, a variety of places from low to high. Um, this is uh, getting soil for clods in the giant forest. And the people were really psyched about sampling and feeling really strong moving all those rocks to sample, um, good times all around. A little bit about camp life. Um, this is a typical camp in a subalpine glacial valley. Um, you'll notice the tarp is there for a reason. We had quite a few thunderstorms. 
um, one of my favorite camps with a view of the divide between Sierra and Kings Canyon and the Chigupa Plateau. Um, you might think, oh, I've been showing you a lot of pictures of rocks. What do you need all these augers for? But we found some good uses for them around camp, um, roasting our fresh corn that the mules carried in. Not all camps were as nice as that one, though. Sometimes it'd get very, very quiet um, and you wake up and your tent is on your face and you wonder why. Um, everyone at the park, including the mules, was it was a great place to work. They were all very interested in what we were doing. Um, they were very supportive. Um, we had a variety of good and bad weather conditions. This is me, Keith, Kathy, and uh, a, a guest, Rebecca. Um, but yeah, as you can see, we got quite a variety of conditions. Um, did I mention that everyone was very interested in what we were doing? Uh, we saw a lot of wildlife in the parks from big to curious, um, sharp-eyed uh, hawks, amphibians, lizards, snakes. Um, if you go to a place called Rattlesnake Canyon, it's named that for a reason. Um, and my favorite animal, the pika, which lives in the very high elevations. We saw some strange things in the parks. Um, those marmots that I just mentioned, apparently people are very concerned in some areas about them getting into their uh, engine and chewing on the hoses. So people came up with creative ways to protect their cars while they're out on backpacking trips. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed when you paste a picture into PowerPoint, it gives you uh, a text caption suggestion and when I pasted these in they all said a car that has been in an accident. I don't know what that says but um, hopefully these were marmot proofed. So um, as I mentioned there were a variety of conditions. Um, you could have sunny amazing uh, great views. This is the Siberian Plateau in the southern portion of the park. You could be sucked in in the giant forest with fog and not be able to see a thing. You could be sucked in with smoke in Kern Canyon um, when wildfires were raging. So you might wonder um, all this walking around, camping, um, did we actually do any work? Uh, some. This is the uh, archaeologist Keith supervising me digging a hole uh, up high. Um, so, you know, you wake up, you think, oh, OK, we're going to work in this beautiful meadow with great views of the crags around. And you get there and the ecologists say, oh, what a great place to collect data. Let's frolic in the meadow and take off our shoes. And the soil scientists say, oh, this is, a, you know, pretty interesting soil. It's different than the usual pile of rocks. Uh, except for the poor guy that has to sample in the floodplain. And uh, yeah, again, variety. So all that frolicking in the meadow must have made the ecologist really tired. Um, for some reason, I found a lot of pictures of, of napping ecologists, but um, the soil scientists nap too, but apparently we're not as smart as the ecologists and choose don't choose nice soft spots to lay down. Don't know why. Um, maybe this has something to do with it. Um, this looks like a great place to dig, doesn't it? This is the metamorphic version of our typical cryer fence, our really extensive high elevation soil. Um, this particular one was fragmental, but we also had a sandy skeletal version. Um, some soils didn't have rocks, but and they ranged from very shallow 
to very deep. This is again Jennifer Wood, our SDQS, um, when we were sampling in the giant forest. Some soils were very hot and dry and dusty. Some were very wet. Um, I I like this picture because it shows well, one, it's just beautiful, um, but it shows the range of landscapes that you might see in the subalpine from, you know, a nice meadow, a lake you might want to take a dip in after work, um, this nice wide glacial valley, the crags um, and exposed rock. But I wanted you guys to know that working in a national park is not all sunshine and bunnies and pikas. Um, sometimes you work here. You might be wondering why you can't see anything. That's because you can't see anything when you're working in the chemise. For those of you in other parts of the country that aren't familiar, it's a, a really common chaparral shrub that's fire adapted and stump sprouts very quickly and thickly after fire. And um, I wanted to show this picture because Kathy and I almost died in the chemise um, about 400 yards from the car because unless you're a bunny, he just it's impenetrable. He can't move. Um, OK, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it felt like we almost died. OK, so enough about the experience. Um, a little bit about the products that we made that um, aren't on web soil survey. This is an example of a block diagram from the detailed soil map. This is Kern Canyon down here in the park. Um, I really like the, how these turned out, just a really nice 3D representation. You, know, you can see the glacial valley, um, the side canyons, the mountain slopes um, and plateaus up above. Um, if anyone wants more information about any of this, feel free to contact me. So um, another thing that we did is a general soil map. And um, just a little to orient you, here's Kern Canyon. The red zones and pink zones here are the metamorphic rock, and the blues and greens um, are the granitic rocks. So I really like the way this map turned out because you can see the big physiographic features like the glacial valleys um, and the river canyons down lower. You can see on the high elevations um, all the you know cirques and crags in brown. Um, uh, just a, you know a really good overview of the park. So um, we're going to go on a little mini tour of the general soil map and one of the block diagrams that we made from it. This is this lower block here to orient you and it goes from uh, the East Fork of the Cahuilla River, this river canyon, all the way up across Mineral King, Kern Canyon up to the crest of the Sierras. And I really like this block because it uh, really shows the difference between the steep dissected river valleys. Um, and you can really tell where it became extensively glaciated and things are you know, really smoothed over these big glacial valleys. Um, we're just going to look at a few soils along the way um, from the different zones. So this is the oxyaquic zero fluvents from the thermic zone at the very far western edge of the park. Um, this was one of the few series that we didn't, um, or a few soils that we didn't set up a series for because it was variable in the riparian areas. Um, you might have, you know, some areas of sand with no rocks or uh, loamy textures or sandy textures or um, so we just kept it at uh, oxyaquic zero flu vents. You can see the rounded um, uh, fragments in the profile and a mix of lithologies from metamorphic and granitic um, where things are coming down. Uh, you can see it's a very high energy environment. This area has might have willows uh, in the floodplain and blue oak 
or live oak uh, woodland on the terraces. Moving up a little bit to the lower montane, this is the Eden Creek series. This was one of our few soils in the park with an argillic horizon. Um, it was moderately deep over weathered granite bedrock. Um, and this is found in the uh, chemise and manzanita area, the shrubberies as we like to call them. Um, moving up again to the giant forest, this was, um, one of our favorite soils, the Sherman series, named after the general Sherman tree in the giant forest, which is the largest tree by volume, I believe, in the world. Um, this is not the general Sherman tree, although it is still impressive. Um, this soil had a water table uh, down deep in the profile, which the sequoias can tap into. Um, moving up to the Mineral King area, this is the Marmot series, a moderately deep soil on metamorphic parent material. And um, the metamorphic soils tend to be loamier and darker in color than the granitic soils. Another example of this is the Mineral King series. So Mineral King itself is down here in the valley. And the soil was found on the hill slopes. Some of the uh, mountain slopes have sagebrush where there's been more recent avalanches. Some are forested um, where there hasn't been a recent avalanche. So this is a very deep loamy skeletal soil, again, darker in color um, on the metamorphic parent material. You can see back in the background here, the line between granitic and metamorphic. Uh, moving up again to the Siberian series. Um, this soil is found on glaciated um, plateaus, mountain slopes, and in glacial valley bottoms. Um, you can see it's got some development, um, BW horizon, and then as you go deeper in the profile, um, you get into sea material and then down deeper, um, I'll show you a close up of this nice root mat. So down below this is densic till where there's basically no pores and the roots say, no thank you, we'll stay up here. So really common soil um, in the lodgepole and foxtail pine dominated um, glaciated areas of the parks. Um, as you move up again on into the cirques and uh, structural benches on mountain slopes, um, you have the isosceles series. Um, so this is a, a slope alluvium uh, soil uh, with wa material washed in in between these bedrock benches. So it's a shallow soil over granitic bedrock. Um, not very many rocks in the profile because of the, the washing of the soil material. Uh, that was also a very common soil in those shallow uh, rocky bench areas. Um, and then the, probably my favorite soil in the park, this is the Polymonium series. Um, this is found on the highest elevation map units of the park and supports um, the teeny tiny alpine vegetation. Here's a close up of um, alpine hulsia and uh, sky pilot, the soil's namesake. Um, which is found on the on the highest elevations. Um, the top of Mount Whitney is the same map unit in series, the Polmonium series. Um, it's uh, a soil that's basically weathering in place. These highest plateaus were unglaciated, so they were nunatex above the, the valley glaciers. And the soil probably has some Aeolian influence. You can see this dark A horizon here. This is fresh sea material that's um, either been um, washed as slope alluvium or, or colluvium deposited over the soil. So to zoom in to this, this dark band, you can see vesicular pores and much finer textures in this um, area of aeolian material than the, the pile of coarse sand that is the rest of the soil.
So just to orient you again, um, we were just here, Polymonium in this green area at the tippy top of the park. Um, and then isosceles in the Cirques, Siberian on the um, glaciated plateaus and valleys, the metamorphic soils, Mineral King and Marmot, um, Sherman and the um, mid montain forested areas, Eden Creek on the very steep slopes, and then down on the river bottom, the first soil that we looked at. And that's all I have. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was awesome to get to share our experience um, working in the parks. I know not everyone gets that opportunity, so um, I, I'm really thankful to the NRCS and the parks for, for having that opportunity. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. There were a couple of questions. I believe we have a little time. <clears throat> One of them is regarding the fragmental soil <clears throat> described in the pile of rocks for the mapping purpose. Do you outline a fragmental typic cryorthin component opposed to calling the component rubble land? Yeah, that was one of the things that um, we we did. We had fragmental or in this case, it was a, a higher taxa component because it could sometimes be fragmental or sandy skeletal. Um, and um, that was something we did because uh, the miscellaneous areas like bubble land don't have any interpretations associated. So that was um, and that's a pretty extensive area of the, the high parts of the park and all those teleslopes. So we wanted to make sure that we had uh, data that went with that. Thank you. <clears throat> and then one other question. <clears throat> In the beginning of the presentation, it was mentioned that the entire survey falls under the Zurich moisture regime. Did you find this to be true even in the higher elevations that accumulate lots of snow? Do you find that the white bark pine and crumolds or high alpine forests to be ustic or eudic? Um, that was a question that we had at the beginning of the survey and we put in, um, I guess we didn't have moisture sensors up that high, but from our experiences digging in those uh, soils up high uh, throughout the summer, we found that they did get quite dry, especially the shallower soils. Um, but yeah, that was a question um, because of thunderstorms or late snow melt. Uh, but we, we decided that, um, you know, I, I guess this would be, if someone really wanted to like instrument the heck out of it and and get more data, um, it's maybe still open to a little bit of interpretation. But um, from our observations, um, it was it was pretty evident that the soils do dry out for for quite some time in order to be xeric. Okay, and we'll sneak one more question in, and that's over the Aeolian layer in the alpine soil. You said there was a layer of colluvium fill. Is that just a gravity mechanism recently? Yeah, I think so. Um, so that Aeolian layer is probably older. Um, that soil has been sitting there uh, since you know the last glaciation, and it might have looked like that soil wasn't uh, it might have looked like it was pretty flat but it was probably a 20 percent slope or so so things are moving in areas like this all the time so either you know if you get a little bit of rain or there's a lot more rock fall and um, just things moving by gravity than you would think and the, so the slopes are steep so things are moving all the time so I think that it was just fresh um, gravel either washed in or just slowly creeping down the slope. OK, thank you again, Julie. If people have other questions, they can still submit them <clears throat> and they will be answered.
Moving on. I do want to remind folks that the next webinar is going to be July 12th and encourage everybody to stay tuned. There will be an announcement sent out uh, to everybody for a link to that. Now we want to move to the second presentation of the afternoon, and that's by Zach Warning of the Belmont, New York area. He will be talking on assessing surface stoniness through both the transect and area methods. Zach, I turn it over to you. All right, let's see. All right. Um, my presentation, unfortunately, will not have beautiful images of incredible sequoias and wondrous landscapes, um, but uh, hopefully still uh, engaging and uh, exciting. So I just want to preface my presentation with saying that I'm still very much uh, a bit of a newbie. I've only been a full time soil scientist for two years. Um, so one thing that my supervisor, Matt Havens, who's in on this call, he's a participant. Um, what he lets me do that I'm really thankful for is to explore <clears throat> in my journey of learning all about, <clears throat> excuse me, soil science is um, if I have any sort of hypothesis or question or something I want to investigate, he really lets me kind of run with it and make those explorations. And that's exactly what I did in this project. Um, we, we were measuring surface stoniness. Um, which is a very important characteristic for soils that I'll, for reasons I'll get into in just a second. But uh, the traditional method is using transects. And I kind of posed the question, well, why not do an area based method if it could potentially save you time, increase your efficiency? And he said, well, go figure it out, test it out. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, so yeah, why do you even measure surface stoniness? You know, what is the impact surface stoniness has on soil. Uh, I love this picture on the right. This is uh, from my supervisor um, showing those soil pedestals protected from that uh, raindrop impact by those teeny tiny surface stones. Um, so you can just imagine when you get to actual stones in excess of 10 inches or boulders, what an impact it has uh, for shielding the soil surface. But beyond just erosion, um, it has impacts on runoff, infiltration, and of course, if you want to impose any sort of management on land and you're using mechanical equipment, if you have um, a high density of these surface stones and boulders, that's going to be uh, extremely difficult and pose a, a serious challenge. So we are measuring stones, which are in excess of 250 millimeters or 10 inches, and boulders in excess of 24 inches. Um, and they break out into these different classifications. Interestingly, as I got into the project, Matt, my supervisor, told me that in New York and especially our MLRA, which is the Glaciated Allegheny Plateau and Catskill Mountains of, of New York and northern southern New York and northern Pennsylvania, that we don't even really use the stony classification because if we did, pretty much every soil in our MLRA would need a stony modifier. Um, being in the in this glaciated area with all this till. Uh, so we really looked at the units that had a very stony and an extremely stony classification and the non stony classification. Um, we didn't get into any rubbly or very rubbly areas for this particular study. Um, the picture in the upper right just shows an example of one I would measure. That one's about 17 inches across, so a, a classic stone. And then in the bottom right, that's one that just misses the mark. It's about eight inches, so it wouldn't be counted, wouldn't be measured. Um, traditionally, as the area method also does this, but you're focusing on the size, spacing, and the proportion of the surface covered by stones. Um, and the traditional method, as I said, uses transects rather than area. So what do the Soil Survey Handbook and Soil Survey Manual say about this? The handbook uh, is pretty general, but it just says by transect techniques or by some combination of visual and quantitative measures. So for more specifics, it refers you to chapter three in the manual, and this says the aerial percentage of the ground surface is determined using point count and or line intersect procedures. But at the end, fortuitously uh, for me, it says this can be done from aerial measurements 
in representative areas. So it's not like I pulled this out of left field, but it is uh, definitely not the, the typical. Um, and I kind of discovered why in certain circumstances. So our methods here, uh, there's the traditional. We laid down two transect lines. Um, we had 100 foot transects, so they were in standard units, not in, but that we used what we had. So 30.5 meters. Uh, the transects are laid down, one going up and down slope, one going across the slope, and you look at every individual foot mark. And if you see a stone or a boulder, you count it as a hit. Um, you're not actually measuring how big the stone or boulder is. You just want to know if it hits that 10 inch or 250 millimeter cutoff. Um, and if you happen to find one that's between two foot marks, it's not counted. Uh, and then you just take your total number of hits over the total number of feet in the transect and you get your percent. The area method, I used those same tapes. I kept them laid down and I'll show diagrams and images more specifically, but kept those two tapes. I placed flagging at the 17 and 83 foot marks, marks, which might seem random, but it produced a 10 meter or 33 foot radius circle plot with four equal quadrants. So I measured all stones in excess of 250 millimeters and counted them. Uh, on their long and short axes, which was um, easier to do because these surface stones were more rectangular in shape. They weren't really rounded. And the percent cover, I used this equation, which looks more complicated than it is. It's just the sum of those long and short axes multiplied together, divided by the total area of the circle times 100 to give me a percent. So this is kind of a diagram of what that would look like. The U is upslope, the A is across slope. Uh, you can see that 10 meter radius and those two arrows are representing in this picture here what it looks like on the ground. Uh, a little difficult to show in a two dimensional image in the woods, but uh, the general idea is that you see the two flag points, you produce an arc between them and you count and measure every stone and boulder from that arc back to the center, which you can see in the upper left. You just overlay the 250 foot marks, flag at 83, flag at 17 on both transects and you go through each quadrant one at a time. Um, they both have their benefits and limitations. Obviously the transect method's quick and easy. Um, it is better in polygons that have a non-uniform distribution of surface fragments. Um, as the manual said earlier, it said in representative areas, aerial methods can be used. So if you have that non-uniform distribution, well then what's a representative area when you're talking about surface stone uh, fragments? Um, the downfall of the transect method is you need multiple transects to accurately categorize the surface stoneous class, and it's kind of an open question as to the, the focus of your study. Well, how specific do you want it? How many transects do you want to lay down? How refined do you want the numbers to be? The area method uh, with one well-placed observation gives you a much better assessment of surface stoneous class than, say, two or three transects might. Uh, and it is better in smaller polygons where, and I experienced this a lot, the transects might overlap or extend beyond the polygon edges. Uh, a lot of these units are on these slopes where I found perhaps from the bottom to the top of the slope is only 70 feet. So you've got 30 feet of transect that's in an entirely separate unit. Um, so it, it was so much easier to just have the area method, which is only the 10 meter uh, radius, and you could just throw it right into the center representative area of the polygon and get a really good assessment of surface stoniness without having to worry about transects wandering off into other polygons. But the area method is more time consuming, does require more attention and more measurement and ultimately more calculation at the end. So what did we come up with here? We had three broad cat categorizations of our units. We had the flaggy units, the very stony units and the non stony units. Um, the flaggy units came out as very stony, very stony came out as very stony, non stony came out as non stony. Seems like everything's in agreement. Um, one thing to note is that the area method unanimously came up with lower estimations than the transect method. Um, and obviously that would change if you added more and more transects. But the central question here is okay, but how many transects do you need? And at what point are you making a trade off of time, time spent? This is each individual unit we looked at. Uh, a lot of data on this table, you don't need to focus on uh, the entire table, 
uh, I would just point out, for example, that um, on the upper right, you see that three of the units we observed, their names were changed. This is primarily because that flaggy modifier is outdated. The county in which we did this work, the survey is 70 years old. Uh, so there's some outdated map units, um, outdated terminology. Um, so we changed them to reflect the very stony classification, but we had to make sure through field observation that it was very stony. Um, you might notice that 81C in both area and transect methods came out non stony, but we still said very stony. That you might be wondering why. Um, just through a multitude of circumstance, we were only able to get into a very small number of 81C units. So we thought it because 81B and 81D were very clearly very stony that if we had been able to get into more units of 81C, it most likely would have gone the same. And with just visual observations, it seemed that there were certainly surface stones there. Um, so it made the most sense to create this harmonious unit. Uh, interestingly, if you look at, for example, down in the bottom 181E and 181F, um, they came out as very stony or even non stony by the transect method in the case of 181F, but we kept them extremely stony. Um, so why would we do that if, if it came out differently? Well, when we looked at especially these units on these steeper slopes, the land capability subclass would not change between extremely stony or very stony. And the slope is the dominating factor here. So rather than go through the process of changing the unit to account for a less limiting uh, classification, we said, well, it's better to keep it the same. Obviously, we're only getting into a proportion of these units. So overall, the mappers who went through, we're going to trust what they witnessed and what they observed. And we're going to say that if a landowner went out and it was less stony than mapped, then that's just a positive for them. So a few interesting observations. This uh, is showing the proportion, uh, no difference, minor difference, and major difference between the area and transect method. No difference is, is obviously, there's no change, no difference in the classification between the two. I considered a minor difference, the difference between a very stony versus an extremely stony, and a major difference was very stony versus non-stony. Because what would often happen with the transect method is there would be surface stones, but they would be between footmarks and I would never catch them. Uh, and you you want to be as unbiased and and simultaneously representative as possible. So you don't want to necessarily be adjusting your transect to make sure that you hit all of the uh, the surface stones. Um, and just with the nature of this project, we weren't going to lay down ten transects across and ten transects up and down when we were also getting the data from the area method. Um, but I thought it was just interesting that about one in five units observed had a major difference. Uh, and interestingly, also in 80% of the sites that had different results, the area method was less limiting than the transect method was. So averaged out, the numbers showed that the names of most of the units do not need to be changed. The primary focus of this was on the that flaggy unit. We needed to figure out exactly what classification it was. Came out with very stony, representative rock fragment cover of about 0.47%. Um, and fortunately, Lordstown, Chanery, Silt, Loam, very stony. Uh, that unit already exists due to the eval work done in the, in the past. So it's a very easy change to execute and it's going to increase consistency across the MLRA. Uh, and this is just showing again those, those new names. Now I had a lot of questions, takeaways, and ideas from this. Um, are transect and circle plot results significantly different? Um, at least in 20% of them, yes. Um, but then how many transects are required to achieve similar results? That I don't know, but it's clearly more than the two. Um, if they are different, is one statistically more likely to be higher or lower in its estimation? I found the area method is lower. Uh, if they are different, which method gives a more accurate assessment of surface stoniness per time spent? And that was the biggest question. That's why I kept thinking about the area method. I thought per time spent in specific instances, I thought it could be better. Um, if stones and boulders are not uniformly distributed across the mapping of polygons, how do you capture this? Ultimately, I think you just need to do multiple transects. Let's say, as I experienced in a few, um, the stones had 
moved by uh, various processes to the bottom of the slope uh, and basically in the upper part of the slope there were no surface stones so you might have a transect that has nothing and then a transect on the bottom that would have tons of surface stones um, an area method wouldn't be able to capture that because it's not uniform the area method by default assumes uniformity um, so that's one thing that's very critical with the area method um, and in areas where stones have been removed by human intervention what class do you use there was a specific instance where i went out in the field uh, and I found no surface stones where theoretically they should have been. And then I stumbled upon a man-made structure that was like the foundation of a building entirely made out of the surface stones. And then I was like, well, what do you say about this? Because clearly they were here and influenced the soil over time, but they're not here now. So that was kind of like, uh, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, I'm always continuing to refine my soil landscape model in my head. Um, this really piqued my curiosity <clears throat> about the origins, behavior, and nature of surface stones. Um, I learned a lot about uh, land capability subclass and the ranking of those limitations. Like when does slope become the dominant limitation? How is that going to affect what you do with your data and, and your results? Um, just learning more about how to take a study into my own hands from the inception to the execution to the analysis. Uh, I became more familiar with these soil series uh, in the landscape and I improved my visual assessment of surface stone in this class to the point that by the end of the study, I could really go out to any site, look at the site, look around, and pretty much every time I could tell before I measured, I'd say, well, this looks like it's going to come out very stony. And I was um, almost always uh, pretty accurate. Um, there are obviously some things that I would change. Uh, you know, I would love to have timed how long each one took. Like, how long does it take to do one transect versus one area plot? And then, you know, let's say you could come up with some sort of uh, one area method equals four transects, something like that, and then compare the accuracy of four transect methods versus one area method or something like that. Um, just in general, I would have used stakes rather than flagging just for better usability and greater visibility in the woods. Sometimes it was just so hard to see where my flag was on the on the tape. Um, and I would have loved to get some more points. We had all sorts of different issues with landowner contact and all these other things. Uh, it would have been great to be able to observe more points. Uh, a few takeaways. Um, there are some method, some circumstances where I would recommend area over transect method. I think it's better in small polygons. Um, obviously, like I said before, with the transect just extending out beyond the limits of the polygon, that was uh, kind of inconvenient, and it was just better to have that area um, plot placed right into the center. Um, when it's normally distributed, the surface fragments, um, that's a must for the area method. Um, when you have fewer polygons that need investigation, maybe you want that more refined number because you don't need to get out into so many polygons. Um, and this one was huge when the help of another is available. Um, I was fortunate to have our ecologist come out and help me. He would get to look at all the vegetation and I'd be running the area method, transect method, and he would just kind of be taking notes for me. And when I had someone where I could just shout out, uh, you know, 17 long, 14 short, and then I would just move on and and uh, that to me doubled or tripled the the amount that I could get done in a day um, with the area method, which to me is if you have help, uh, the area method is probably comparable, if not better, per time spent than the transect method. But in other circumstances, I would not recommend the area method. The, these large polygons, if you have to get to a point where you're using multiple area methods over this, uh, a single polygon, at that point, I would just use transects. Um, if there's an irregular distribution, you just you can't use the area method. Um, just uh, it wouldn't make sense with the assumptions of the model. Um, if you have multiple, multiple polygons that require investigation, then you are likely going to want to uh, move th through them rather quickly if you don't need quite a refined, quite as refined of a number. Um, and if you're working alone, it is so much easier working alone to do the transect method than it is having to squat down with the tape and measure the axes and then jot them down on the uh, on the clipboard and then move on. Doing that alone was arduous. 
future studies. Um, I, I, again, I'd love to do actual timing uh, is one method going to have higher accuracy for time spent. Um, upslope versus downslope, is there a difference in distribution? I thought that in a few units there was. Um, I'm curious how surface stones affect ecology. Um, if they affect ecology, if they affect only certain parts of ecology, um, you know, especially if I would love to look beyond vegetation uh, because I imagine these really stony areas, I wonder how the invertebrates or um, other organisms would be affected by what could potentially be some form of habitat for them. Um, and then when I mentioned that it piqued my interest about the nature, origins, and behavior of these surface stones, this is what I mean when I say, like, is this random? Does it change over time? Can it be predicted or modeled? Uh, again, if, if I remove them, um, how's that going to affect things? How long until they come back? Are there replacements similar in distribution and size? And could surface stones from that lens be considered a dynamic soil property? If you manually remove them, um, that's within a human lifetime and you're altering the, the soil. Um, I, I just, I wonder how that works. So I'm really hoping to hear from other people in other parts of the country what they've experienced measuring things like surface stoniness and and methods they've used and um, really uh, if anyone has any sort of questions or comments I I would be very happy to hear them and there's my contact information so thank you thank you Zach uh, there was one question in the chat and that's were stone walls noted. Yeah, so whenever I came across something like that building foundation or stone walls, um, I would make a note and we would definitely have to look at, okay, if I saw a stone wall and this unit, which is supposed to be very stony, came out non-stony, we would take that in with a bit of a grain of salt um, in, in, into our calculation. Like, well, this was probably very stony when it was mapped, so I don't think the mapping is wrong. The, the question that's kind of open is, but how are, how are you going to let this affect future interpretation? Because they're not there, but will they come back? How soon will they come back? What's the distribution gonna be like? Those are kind of open questions that I don't know the answer to. Okay, and then I was just thinking, how about using a drone to take a an aerial photo of the land and then using image analysis to come up with the surface area covered by stones? Yeah, I wonder that that would be um, interesting. I wish we had a drone. That'd be awesome. Um, go pick one up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was just saying. Anyway, uh, we're at right about the end of our time. There were no more questions in the chat. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Julie, for your presentations. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your attendance. Uh, if you remember, the next uh, present uh, webinar is going to be on July 12th. I think we're looking pretty good for that, but we are starting to look a little bit thin on presentations into August. So remember the list of topics and the map that I showed, and let's uh, fill in the topic areas and add some presentations from underrepresented areas of the country. With that, I wish you all a good Tuesday. Bye, folks. <laughs>